Welcome to University Showcase. I'm Megan Kamrak. This week marks the 78th anniversary of the world's first nuclear explosion with the Trinity Test in southern New Mexico. A new film focused on the physicist who led the effort to develop the bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer, also opens nationwide this week. My guest today, Lucy Genet, came to the University of New Mexico as a visiting graduate student and began researching the Manhattan Project. She quickly realized that the bulk of narratives focused on the scientists who came to New Mexico rather than New Mexicans themselves and their experiences with the creation of the bomb and the ensuing buildup of the nuclear industry here. She also saw the vast income disparities despite the wealth brought to the state through the industry. Janae works to uncover those stories in her book, Land of Nuclear Enchantment, A New Mexican History of the Nuclear Weapons Industry. It's published by University of New Mexico Press. The title is an homage to photographer and artist Patrick Nagatani, whose relatives lived near Hiroshima. His work chronicled the ongoing after effects of nuclear testing, mining and development in New Mexico. Janae is an associate professor of civilization at the Université de Limoges in France. Where did you find the voices of ordinary people? Mainly at the Center for Southwest Research at the Zimmerman Library uh, on UNM campus. Most of the voices come from this uh, oral history program called Impact Los Alamos. And then I compiled those with newspaper articles from the time period, other oral histories that were available online. I didn't have a car when I was doing this research. I had very limited resources, so I was not able to interview people as much as I would have liked to, perhaps. And in the book, you give us historical context about New Mexico in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, that it was almost an internal colony of the United States. Why is it important to understand that as we look at the nuclear legacy here? So, of course, this is not a revolutionary idea. I cite in the book all the other scholars who have addressed the relations between the East and the West from a colonial perspective, internal colonial perspective. The whole idea of the um, land of nuclear enchantment is to include more recent history, post-World War II history, into that longer process of conquest of the West and then utilization of the West as place where resources can be extracted and where potentially dangerous activities can be conducted for very practical reasons because of a lower demographic density uh, that is you know the official justification but but also because of, of a form of invisibility that's what uh, Tracy Voyles calls uh, waste landing. Uh, transforming populations and places into pollutable spaces and bodies. And it was really in the testimonies themselves, you know, a lot of the interviews that were recorded were people who talked about the great opportunities that came with the project and with all the jobs that were created, not just at Los Alamos, but at Sandia, in the, in the mines at first, uh, the uranium mines. And then with Carlsbad, a little bit later with WIP, the Waste Isolation Pipeline. So those were economic opportunities. And to understand the enthusiasm, you have to go back to see how far back these people were. They were traveling far away to feed their families uh, a lot of the times. So, so it was liberating to be able to work close to home. And then you had this disillusionment that many expressed, sometimes mm. second or third generation who said, well, there was a limit to that boom, and there was a cost. You write that the view that the scientists and other atomic transplants had of their surroundings at Los Alamos was largely borrowed from tourist brochures, as well as the Western genre and the national experience of Manifest Destiny. How did those ideas form the foundation between these newcomers and um, New Mexicans who are already here? A lot of those newcomers had a very blurry concept of where and what New Mexico was. So necessarily those who did know about, associated the West with the Western genre and what uh, they could have 
potentially read in popular culture, which I think is a pretty common way of thinking or imagining a place where you've never been. I mean, it was the same for me before I went to the United States. Most of what I knew came from popular culture. Once there, it meant that I'm guessing it created this form of lens through which necessarily the people who had arrived saw their the landscape and New Mexicans who corresponded to this colorful, timeless image that they had. An exoticism in some ways. Yeah, definitely. I mean, some of the examples that are in the book do present the locals as exotic or there's a form of fascination with otherness. People did find good jobs, but there were limits for a lot of folks on that and an idea of what jobs local New Mexicans could do mm -hmm. as the lab grew after the Manhattan Project into Los Alamos National Laboratory. So it seemed like those foundations kind of <laughs> set a path forward sometimes for how far people could advance. Right. Yeah. So that's where it ties back into what we're saying about going back to to explain, not to justify, but to explain the, the context and the fact that a lot of the people who were able to secure jobs at the beginning did not have a very thorough you know, education from school. Some of them had not graduated middle school or high school. So they were limited at first by their skill level. But then for next generations who had been able to get an education and to attend local colleges and universities, they were still competing with others from much more well-known or renowned institutions across the country. That's where the, the habits of the earlier days uh, became more evident and became more problematic for uh, new generations who also wanted to to be hired on the best paying and the most rewarding positions. That was, again, said by many of the voices gathered here, but that was also substantiated by some of the more economic reports and, and statistical sources that I found. What did you hear from residents who transitioned from working on the land to working at the lab? It really depends on the individuals and it depends where as well, because the, the book does not center on Los Alamos. You know, the, the people who had to give up their ranches in, in the Tularosa Basin, for example, were extremely bitter, especially since they were promised several times that their land would be given back and then it never was the case. So there were mixed feelings, also very uh, emotional moments described by people who returned and did not recognize the, the place and cried about, this is where my ranch was, this is where my life was. And then you have people who are extremely supportive and will say that Los Alamos really changed their lives. And I think that it's important to not romanticize, you know, working on the land. I mean, it's very, very difficult work. It's admirable work, but it's endless. It's extremely backbreaking and it's very difficult. So it's understandable for people at that time who were really struggling to make a living to feel relief at being able to, to have just an easier job. What I found interesting, so some of the people did not necessarily work on the land, but uh, were hired as sheep herders or as miners in other states. And what I found interesting was the way that they compared the hazards of live, working in the nuclear industry to their previous experiences on the railroad, on in the mines, etc., saying that in comparison, this new job, this new life seemed very safe. Again, it's the theme of invisibility and the fact that the effects of radiation, for example, are stochastic and, and uh, they are very difficult to pinpoint and to connect and so that made it less tangible to, to those people who were used to potentially violent death on their jobs, yeah. This is University Showcase. I'm Megan Kamrick, and I'm speaking with Lucie Genet. She's an associate professor of civilization at the Université de Limoges in France, and she's the author of Land of Nuclear Enchantment, a New Mexican History of the Nuclear Weapons Industry, published by University of New Mexico Press. How did the Manhattan Project and then the creation of the nuclear industry here transform New Mexico? So first, it transformed New Mexico in, in uh, its economy by increasing its economy and 
and bring much more diversity in its um, economic landscape. Obviously, it changed in New Mexico demographically with uh, the influx of many, many people who came to work in that field. Then it also changed the environment of New Mexico, you know, the excellent orphaned land by V.B. Price that talks about the uh, environmental impact of the Manhattan Project in New Mexico. That obviously led to political strife and social movements in, in New Mexico. And one thing I always use in presentations or, or talking to students is the map of, of New Mexico and inequalities. So that is one thing that is quite striking, is the fact that Los Alamos is one of the richest counties in the nation, while New Mexico remains one of the poor states. And so there's a, the inequalities have skyrocketed. So yes, I don't want to paint a, a negative or positive picture of this evolution based on the people who express their opinions in those oral histories, etc. It's often mixed feelings, double-edged sword, sometimes a lot of anger, sometimes a lot of joy at being part of something so big. So I really don't want to simplify the complexity of this history. It is complex. Your book brings that out. You actually use the phrase scientific conquest. Can you talk a little bit about that and then what it means in the context of New Mexico history? That's, again, is connected to the concept of internal colonialism and the idea that there were three main conquests. And, and again, if you look at what uh, Joseph Masco, the, uh, the anthropologist who worked on this, wrote, he makes the same argument, this idea that um, New Mexico was conquered several times, first by the Spanish and then by the Anglo-American. And we can make the argument that what happened during and after World War II would correspond to third conquest with equally drastic changes. So you could, of course, talk about a nuclear conquest, or an atomic conquest, but the reason I chose to call it scientific was because of all the ramifications of this arrival of atomic science. It's also connected to mining, to storage of waste. If you look at what the Sandia Lab does, there's a lot of about the components, and, but also uh, space and solar and, and all kinds of things. So that's why I, I use the term scientific to be uh, broader in scope and be able to include all parts of New Mexico that were affected by the, the arrival of this new science. And land is so key here. It's so important and culturally intrinsic for Pueblo people and New Mexico, uh, northern New Mexico, Hispano residents, for ranchers. So why did that fact make for a particularly poignant clash with Anglo culture and the nuclear industry? You go into that quite a bit. So land is an issue that you can never discard when talking about the American West. A lot of the history has to do with the land and what it means to different cultures. So it made sense to start with that and to some extent to, to end with it as well because the book ends with uh, talking about memory and there's a lot of this culture that is tied to the memory of the land and how people see their own memories, the individual memories tied to the land and their experiences on the land. I think that's one of the things that is the most compelling about New Mexican culture is, uh, so you mentioned, of course, each group that you mentioned or subgroups will have different views and different connection to, to the land. Uh, the most obvious one, of course, will be uh, the uh, Native American connections and the, the Hispanic population who have a very common communal uh, approach. But the Anglo-American ranchers, you know, who uh, survived in the Tilarosa Basin have also expressed that attachment to, to the land. So, and there's this layering as well of the different institutions, different authorities, and that have imposed their own views. Um, so I do believe that the complexity in the history of the West 
is connected to those intricacies in land issues, land uses and relations. I have interviewed downwinders whose families were in the vicinity of the Trinity test, and I know they have still not gained compensation. I was shocked when I read your book, My Own Ignorance, um, as I'm learning more of this history, that it took over 60 years to get any compensation for people whose land was used for Los Alamos National Laboratory and also San Ildefonso Pueblo and the ranch, the McDonald Ranch, where Trinity took place. It took extraordinary efforts to get any compensation. And I do think that one of the key words is in that political discourse is also the issue of acknowledgement, because not only was there no compensation, but it's also a matter of, of existence, of being recognized as living there, as being affected. It's almost a matter of human dignity. In some of these instances, the Pajarito Plateau and the McDonald Ranch, I'm, people were under the impression that this was temporary mm -hmm. and they would be able to go back. Yeah, in some cases, I think there was, a, again, a cultural and language barrier, probably with not a ton of effort in some cases to, to make sure that uh, the communication was, was effective. Uh, of course, this was wartime, so a lot of the people that moved were, were happy to do their part and were glad to express their patriotism. But there was, of course, hope that the war would not last forever and that it would, when it finally ended, people would be able to go back to their properties and pick up their lives where they had left them. And that was not the case. So that is, for some people, that was extremely painful. You write that the memory of the Manhattan Project has become support for the existence of Los Alamos National Laboratory, sort of that patriotic fervor too. And you write this, quote, the juxtaposition of historical landmarks and modern buildings is the physical representation of U.S. capacity to superimpose layers of invasion while nostalgically romanticizing past lives and markers of previous presences. I just was thinking about the very first time, I was in probably 2003, I went to the Bradbury Science Museum and they had an older black and white film talking about the people on the Pajarito Plateau and they said, these people were happy to give up their land. But I didn't, at the time I saw it, I was like, I wonder if that's totally true. <laughs> Talk a little bit about what you're saying there. That passage really struck me. Um, so that passage was inspired from the uh, Romero cabin and the homestead tour. Los Alamos is, is a little bit like an open museum that is combined with a, with a town, right, with a company town, some people have called it, uh, because it's so tied with the lab. So that's what I mean by this layering. And then, of course, you have the old build buildings from the rain school, and then you will have a few markers that talk about presence of, you know, the um, ancestors, the Pueblo people. Uh, of course, Bandelier is right next door. And when you go to Bandelier, it's very interesting how you drive. And on your left side, you will see parts where it says no entry because this is part of the lab. So you really have this, again, this intricate layering and interconnection of places that have different significance uh, depending on who you ask and which group you talk to. So there is this sort of invasion in the sense of an influx of people taking possession of a place for a specific purpose. And of course, the fact that there were, you know, archaeological artifacts or ruins that were destroyed as well and replaced with radioactive waste on the Mesa. So that's a very impactful image in terms of layering and inv invasion of, of a previous culture. The... Museums, I'm glad you mentioned the museums because those are also always very interesting. So Jan Farrow Brody wrote this book about the first atomic bombs. It's an update on the history of Trinity. And she talks a lot about the museums and how there's nostalgia, patriotism, and fascination for science that is often at the forefront of the story of the narrative in the, in the museums. And a real struggle with how to approach darker sides of history. And I guess that might be one of the differences between European approaches and, and American approaches to memory. 
I'm part German, so the way that the Germans have approached, you know, the history of World War II and the, the responsibility in the Holocaust is interesting in that respect. I'm Megan Kamrick, and this is University Showcase on KUNM. I'm speaking with Lucy Genet, author of Land of Nuclear Enchantment, a New Mexican History of the Nuclear Weapons Industry, published by UNM Press. She's an associate professor of civilization at the Université de Limoges in France and studied at UNM in graduate school. So how have TV and film productions continued to ignore the stories of New Mexicans and the impact of building the bomb? The one example that comes back quite often is the Manhattan series. I guess that's probably the, the one cultural object that spent the most time. It was shot in New Mexico. It did have the space, you know, to include a little bit more New Mexicans. And to some extent, it did. There were characters and but again, there was a lot of, you know, exoticism and the landscape and the people are there to provide the setting for the scientists who are really the, the heroes of the story. I only uh, talk about two scenes uh, in the conclusion of the book because they reveal the way that the help was romanticized, right? But it doesn't go further than that. There's one character that has a little bit of a, of a side story that we get to know a little bit, but we don't really know that much about this character. And, and then at Trinity, there's this notion of who is it going to hurt? There, there's just tumbleweed and, and wildlife. Which is definitely not true. Which is definitely not true, because this notion of the desert as being empty is completely outdated. Yeah, that would be the, exa the recent example where there was potentially space, but very little substance was actually given to, to the local landscape and the local people. And then most of the popular productions really focus on Oppenheimer. <laughs> There's, and, you know, we, we've got an example yep. <laughs> coming up. Probably one of the biggest productions ever around mm -hmm. this story, Christopher Nolan. Uh, it's based on the book American Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense yet of whether we might see more of these stories in this film? That's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm very eager to find out when I, when I go to the cinema. Based on the trailer, it doesn't look like New Mexico is going to play a crucial part, except for, again, providing the backdrop, providing the background for, for the story. But I guess we'll see. It's also interesting to note that New Mexico has a very prominent cinema industry, right? The movie industry is quite substantial in New Mexico. A lot of big films and blockbusters have been shot there. So, And there are so many stories connected to the nuclear era that involved local people, anonymous people, that would deserve attention from Hollywood or from smaller outlets and I mean, there have been novels, so there are quite a few novels that are set in New Mexico, like Los Alamos Wives telling mm -hmm. stories and things like that. But again, it's it often centers on those transplants, on the people that came in and participated in the project, rather than those who were already there and whose lives were affected by the arrival of this new factor in their lives. Yeah. Well, we should note, as you note in your book, that this week, July 16th, was not only the anniversary of Trinity, but it was the anniversary in 1979 of the Church Rock Mine Tailings disaster, which was the worst release of radiation in U.S. history, mm -hmm. far worse than Three Mile Island. Very few people seem to know about this. Yes, that was a uh, fell on the uranium mill on the pond. Um... Uh, containing radioactive waste and it went into the Rio Puerco. It affected a lot of people, but people who had very little political cloud, very little visibility again. And it was eclipsed by March uh, 1979, which was uh, the Three Mile Island accident that mm -hmm. everybody goes to as an example of accident on U.S. soil. Now there's the Church Rock accident. There was also an accident in 1961 in, in Idaho where three people died and mm -hmm. it was an explosion of a nuclear reactor, the SL-1. But very few people have heard about it, although it was the only lethal, like on the spot explosion. So again, this invisibility of, of events, of people, of places is really a thread uh, across the nuclear West. 
This is ongoing, of course. The federal government approved plans for an interim storage facility for high-level nuclear waste by Holtec International in southern New Mexico. The waste isolation pilot plant permit was just renewed. And I know your latest book is about the Pantex plant in Amarillo, but will you be doing more scholarship in New Mexico? What, what do you see as the ongoing issues that other scholars can pick up if, if you're not coming back to New Mexico? <laughs> yeah, I would love to go back to New Mexico, but uh, actually my current project is about the Idaho National Laboratory because it's mm. attracted very little scholarly attention. There are very few uh, books. That was the reason why I worked on Pantex. It, there was only one book published in 1986 by Grace Mushtabai. So the, there seemed to be a big you know, void there about the history. There are a lot of connections between Pantex and New Mexico because the, the industry, of course, has cooperation uh, links. There's also competition between the various places they are trying to gain new contracts. And then there's a whole network of uh, social movements. You know, all those organizations based in different states are in contact with each other. And so you see that in the archives. You see the newsletters that mention people in, in New Mexico and Idaho and Nevada and other places. But there is one thing that maybe in the future, if I'm able to go back or, or not me, I mean, my obviously I would be glad to see other other people pick that up. But I do think that the Sandia National Laboratories have received little attention and um, their history could be a good place to talk about the nuclear industry in New Mexico a bit more. There are a couple of unpublished sources about the evolution of Albuquerque uh, with the development of the Sandia Laboratories. So that would definitely be something to look into, I would say. And then, of course, as you mentioned, this is ongoing, so I suspect there will still be a lot to say. I mean, here you have updates about the Trinity site, the memorialization of nuclear history in the West is a, is a big topic, uh, atomic and nuclear tourism in New Mexico. Also, we can talk about the uh, transition, you know, the ecological transition from oil and gas to renewables and how nuclear energy plays into that. Obviously, there's the issue of where to store the waste. There's also mm -hmm. the issue of uranium enrichment, which is taking place in Yunus. That's the only facility in the U.S. But new advanced reactors need a kind of fuel that is produced only in Russia at the moment. So with the Biden administration promoting nuclear as a solution to climate change, which is a form of eco-modernism, it's pro-nuclear environmentalism, we can ask what will be the place of New Mexico in, in that transition. There is a lot of concern about the reopening of uranium mines in the West to increase the independence of the United States in, regarding fuel for, for its reactors. So is there going to be another nuclear renaissance? Mm. They haven't even cleaned up the tailings from the mines that were there before. Mm -hmm. A lot of right. them. Yeah. 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 So there are a lot of questions up in the air right now, but that would definitely deserve attention and analysis from scholars. Well, Lucy Jeunet, really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Megan. I really appreciate taking part in this uh, with my small, modest contribution. <laughs> That was Lucy Jeunet, author of Land of Nuclear Enchantment, A New Mexican History of the Nuclear Weapons Industry, published by University of New Mexico Press. She is an associate professor of civilization at Université de Limoges. Join me next month where we will continue our discussion with UNM assistant professor Mariah Gomez, author of Nuclear Nuevo México, Colonialism and the Effects of the Nuclear Industrial Complex on Nuevo Mexicanos. You can hear this episode and all our episodes at KUNM.org. Thanks to Associate Professor David Bashwinner for our theme music. I'm Megan Kamrick. Thanks for listening to University Showcase. Mm -hmm.